We could say this, that no matter where we are in the Bible, that the Bible's teaching us a couple of things. And we looked at this last week in our course seminar, the storyline of the Bible, but we can kind of sum that up by saying this, that um, the Bible is teaching us, number one, that we're far more sinful than we ever believed. Like that's what the Bible's declaring to us, that we, we don't wanna recognize that. We wanna run from that. We wanna color that up. We wanna pretend that, that I'm not as sinful as I really am. I'm not as sinful as my neighbor. I'm not as sinful as certainly the folks on the news. I'm not as sinful as the politicians. I'm not as sinful as my spouse. I'm not as sinful. I'm not as sinful. We say that often, but what the Bible declares to us is that we're, we're more sinful than we, uh, than we wanna b- really believe about ourselves. But it also declares a second truth to us, and that is that we are more loved than we ever hoped for. That God loves us. And what the Bible is declaring to us is there is a means for us. There's a way, he has provided a way to rid us of our sin, that we can find atonement and we can find forgiveness, that we can, as we just sang about, that we can shake off those guilty fears. And that means and that way is in the person and the work of Jesus. And so we're in the part of the Bible. Um, If you wanna go ahead and take out your Bibles, turn with me to Exodus. We're looking at the tabernacle So this building that was built, that's what we looked at in detail last week. We're gonna finish that up this week and then we're gonna get into the role and the function of the high priest. And so what we said last week is what we have in the tabernacle is we have a partial undoing of the work of the fall. And so in Genesis, uh, it tells us the story begins with, with the events of creation of how God is a creator God and how God has created out of nothing with just speaking his word. He, he creates the heavens and the earth and he, he bends down and stoops down and he forms man out of the dust of the ground and he breathes life into the nostrils of man and man becomes alive. And it's the first man ever born, a man named Adam. And then he, he takes out of the rib of Adam and forms another uh, a, a woman right? Like when Adam sees her, he names her, he goes, whoa, man. You know, that's what he says when he sees, uh, this is my grandpa's jokes. It just works its way in. Isn't that great? <laughs> and so uh, he, he sees the woman. And so, and the story begins and, and, the, and they make it about a, about a half a chapter in, in this great relationship with the Lord, where the Lord comes and dwells with them bodily. I mean, the, the, the God, the, you know, God himself, his manifest presence is in the garden and then they sin against God. They do the one thing that God asked them not to do. You, you know, we would think, like, just give me one, Lord. I think I could do that. And yet what it proves is, again, that we're more sinful than we would ever even want to realize, would ever want to admit. And so Adam and Eve, they sin against God. And what we see happening um, in Genesis 3 is God expels, he kicks out, he banishes um, Adam and Eve out of the garden, but not only out of the garden, away from his presence, And that's just a perfect picture of sin, that sin separates us from God. It separates and breaks. There's a chasm in our relationship with the Lord. And what begins right there is God mending that relationship. And so he's painting a picture of how that relationship is gonna be mended. And it's ultimately gonna be mended in and through Jesus. That what we're reading here isn't plan A and it fails and plan B is Jesus. Plan A, B, C, D, all the way to the end of the alphabet is Jesus, Jesus alone. And what God is giving for us, even in this text, is God is giving us a, a lens. He's given us a categories, a, a ways for us to understand Jesus when Jesus comes, for us to w- understand his role and his function. And so we see as we're seeing a, a partial, I said, undoing of the work of the fall, because in the tabernacle, God comes and dwells again with his people. He, he tells them, I want you to build this place. And we looked at how it's to be built. And when you build that place, then I'm going to come and I'm gonna dwell among my picture. And so I'm, I'm gonna come and dwell among my people. Now, uh, a picture is worth a thousand words. So let me show you a picture. Or also we would say a picture is worth about a half hour of reading of the, of the Old Testament. All right, so last week I read about a half hour. And this week we can sum it up with this picture because that's what we read about. So what you have here is an artist rendering um, we know that this isn't a real picture and nor has it been Photoshop because Photoshop hadn't been invented then. But nevertheless, it's an artist's rendering of what the tabernacle um, looked like. And you see even off in this picture, you see off um, kind of out is all of the, the people camped. So you've got a, a upwards to maybe a million, maybe a million and a half people 
that have been freed from Egypt and they're all camped out around the tabernacle. The tabernacle um, is there in the middle. And last week, what we looked at, we looked at some parts of the tabernacle. We looked at the Ark of the Covenant that's all the way in the back that's kind of shining. That's the very place of the, the presence of God. That's where he would come again and manifest himself. Inside of the Ark of the Covenant is the Ten Commandments. At this time, later there'll be uh, uh, other items will be added, but right now, just the Ark of the Covenant. We also looked at um, what's called the, let's see, the lampstand, which is there to the left. Last week, we looked at also uh, the, the table and the showbread, the, the, um, the, the bread of presence, it's called, which is there on the right as you enter into the tabernacle. We also looked at parts and pieces of the tabernacle. The, the tabernacle is made up of three parts. There is the outer courts or the courtyard, and then you have the, the tabernacle kind of itself, which is broken into two parts. You've got the holy place where the lampstand and the showbread is, and then you've got a veil And then you enter into the most holy place. And so only the priest who there's one at this time, Aaron, and his sons who will become priests. But right now there's one high priest, Aaron, and only Aaron can enter into the the tabernacle itself. And or only the priest can enter into the tabernacle, the holy place. And only Aaron can enter into the holy of holies. And so this is what I want us to mark down and to think about. Maybe you want to write this down. Is what is what what does all this mean for us? It means this, that God welcomes sinners and, that, and he welcomes them so that they may deal with their sin. Why do we talk about sin so often? often it's because I, we just like to talk about the obvious. But listen, in, in the midst of our sin and when we can realize and admit our sin, that there's good news, that God doesn't just leave us as sinners, but he deals with our sins and he's established a means so we're going to look at today, he's established a means of forgiveness for our sins. And that's the good news that John writes in his little book in 1 John 2, 1 and 2. He says, my children, I write these things to you so that you may not sin. And then he says this, but if you sin. Like how many of you just honest, like how many of you, like that's me, I'm the one if I sin, right? I'm honest enough, I'm gonna, I'll admit that right here. But if you sin, he says this, but if you sin. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous, that he is the propitiation for our sins, not only for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And so what we're going to see in the tabernacle, in the parts and the pieces of the tabernacle, we're going to talk about the courtyard of the tabernacle and a few other pieces that we see scattered out. We need to talk about, but even in the courtyard, it means that God welcomes sinners So that when you sin, you have something to do with your sin. You have a place to go. That's what he's saying. The the courtyard's open to anyone. Come, come near the presence of God. Come and bring a sacrifice in. And so that's the, the, what we see again, the partial undoing of what happens in the fall. Because when Adam and Eve sin, as the effects of their sin, what, what do they do? They run from God at first. They hide in the bushes and while they're there, they, they get together some fig leaves. They feel this, this sense of shame that's found up in their nakedness, that prior to the fall, prior to the sin, the Bible says that they were naked and knew no shame. And now all of a sudden, you know, Adam's looking at Eve all weird, and we, Eve's looking at Adam all weird, and they're like, we're naked, you know? This is really awkward. And they feel this sense of shame, this sense of guilt. And so they, they make some fig leaves, and they cover themselves, and they hide from God. And then God comes, God calls out to Adam, Adam, where are you? It's not that he doesn't know where Adam is, but it's a display of God's grace and God's mercy. He's crying out to Adam. And what this is a declaration in the courtyard is you don't have to run from your sin. That when you sin, not if you sin, but when you sin, you don't have to run and you don't have to hide. You don't have to cover it up. You don't have to make light of it. That you can be honest and forthright with God about your sin. And so what would happen here during this time is when the people sinned, again, when, when the people would sin and they wanted atonement for their sin, forgiveness for their sin, then they would get get an animal to be sacrificed. They would kind of trek through the million to a million and a half people, get through all of that to come to the tabernacle. They would enter into the eastern gate, which is the gate down below, one gate. As they entered in, Aaron 
or one of his sons as the priest would meet them there. They would take the animal. They would kill the animal, drain the animal of its blood. This is found in Leviticus 1. It tells us exactly how to do it. It's called a a burnt offering. They would take some of the blood, throw it upon the altar, cut the animal up into pieces, place it onto the altar in order for it to be burned on the altar. And so that's the first thing that you see as you enter into the gate. I think it's poignant. The first thing you're going to run into is this altar. And so if you have your Bibles, let's read about it. In, in Exodus, the 27th chapter, it's called the bronze altar. He says this, starting in verse 1, You shall make the altar of acacia wood, five cubits long and five cubits broad. The altar shall be square and its height shall be three cubits. You shall make horns for it on its four corners. Its horns shall be of one piece with it. You shall overlay it with bronze. You shall make pots for it to receive its ashes and shovels and basins and forks and fire pans. You shall make all its utensils of bronze. You shall make it for... You shall make it for a grating. You shall make for it a grating, a network of bronze. And on the net, you shall make four bronze rings at its corners. You shall set it under the ledge of the altar so that the net extends halfway down the altar. And you shall make poles of the altar, poles of acacia wood, and overlay them with bronze. And the poles shall be put through the rings so that the poles are on the two sides of the altar when it is carried. You shall make it hollow with boards as it has been shown you on the mountain, so you shall be made. Now, we'll go back to that picture of the tabernacle. I don't think this is the best picture because what they've done here is look at the, um, look at the altar. The, the altar's actually on top And we don't really read that in this account of Exodus. I think maybe the next picture is a better picture because what it says the bronze altar in size is about seven foot, six inches square by about four foot, six inches tall. And so the priests were short men, I guess, right? As they lean over the side. And so, like I said, this was a declaration that God welcomes sinners, and not only does he welcome sinners, he doesn't just leave them as sinners, but God's saying here that come, come, let us read, like in Isaiah, he says, come, let us reason together. Although your sin may be as, as, um, as scarlet, I can, I can wash it white as so, although your, your sin may be like crimson, I will make it like wool. That's what the declaration of this picture is. Come, let's deal with your sin. Be honest, and the means to which we're going to deal with it is through a sacrifice. And so the principle here is that sin is costly. A sacrifice is involved in forgiveness. The forgiveness will sin will cost someone something. That every time you sin, that's what he's teaching people, every time you sin, something has to die. Why why is that so? Well, it goes back to what we see in the garden in creation. Adam and Eve sin. They try to make for themselves some fig leaves to cover their nakedness, to cover their sin, cover their shame. God shows up. What they had made was inadequate. And so it says that God sacrifices. He kills the first sacrifice in the Bible. God kills an animal, skins it, right? Makes some leather chaps and whatever, you know? Leather vest for Adam and Eve. Maybe it's it's not. Maybe it's, you know, I just just picture leather. I don't know why, you know? Maybe it's like, but anyway, what would that be? Like wool, itchy. Right? But he makes clothes for them. And something, when Adam and Eve sinned, something innocent died. It sets up the idea of sacrifice. And that's what he's teaching the people here. It's a costly and it's a, it's a costly thing. There's a sacrifice involved. And even this, we could say this because, again, it drained of the blood. And we're going to see a lot of blood today, just to be honest, in the text. What's that mean? What, look, look. When we sin, it's a blood, bloody affair. In order to, to, to get atonement with our sin, it is a bloody affair. So next in, um, in the tabernacle, I'm going to jump um, out of order in the text, but I just want to kind of get in, before we get into the priest, priestly garments, um, I want to look at all of the rest of the pieces. And so we've hit about everything. We've just got two more pieces left. You'll see, as you, again, as you enter into the um, eastern gate, on the right-hand side, there is this basin, and it's called the bronze basin. And so you, we can read about that over in Exodus 30. So in Exodus 30, it says that God has for them to build this bronze basin. Um, we, uh, we, we won't read it to, in order to save some time, but here's what's happening in the, in the bronze basin is it's a place of washing. 
It's where Aaron, not, not, not us, because we're not priests, but it's where Aaron and his sons would go to wash. And so prior, for, prior to them being able to approach the altar, they had to go and they had to go through this ritualistic washing in order before they could go into the holy place or especially the holy of holies, they had to go through this ritualistic washing. And what God says is like, if you don't, you will die. I mean, that's pretty, you know what I'm saying? Like I, those of you with kids, it's like, go wash your hands. They come back like, dirt underneath their fingernails, right? Markers still on the back of their hands. You go, no, go in there and wash them good. Sing the song, right? Do your ABCs, all of that. I mean, there's one thing just like, because we don't want our kids to get germs, but God, what God's saying here is no. Like this, this is important, right? If you don't wash properly, if you don't go through these steps and follow them, you will die. So what, God, what is God teaching? I mean, that seems awful, awful harsh, God. No, what God, again, is teaching us here is that sin makes us dirty and we have to be cleansed. There's a proper cleansing that needs to take place. We must be clean to worship the Lord or in order to enter the presence of the Lord. You gotta be clean. You wanna enter into the presence of the Lord? Right? You wanna enter into the presence of the Lord? Just say it in, I think it's in uh, maybe Jeremiah, uh, you know, who, who can ascend the, the hill of the Lord? Who can ascend into his mountain? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. Those are the only ones that get to ascend into the hill of the Lord. You wanna enter into the presence of the Lord? You've gotta be clean to enter into the presence of the Lord. The next piece that we see here is inside again in the holy place and it's called the altar of incense. And so it's this gold box and on it, the uh, Aaron would place uh, incense to burn and it would, it would rise up and the, I'm sure the smell would fill the tabernacle and fill the area. And so it's kind of like, okay, what's the point of that, Lord? And well, this is what I think the point of it is, is, is like, can you imagine a million people camped out around the tabernacle in the wilderness, the base of Mount, base of Mount Sinai? So you got a thousand people, right? Not really caring at this time all that much about hygiene, right? No means of like what I used to do for a living. Like nobody's come in there and dug and put down sewer lines and laterals and trunk lines and storm sewers. And none of that is there. On top of the million people, you got livestock. Like are you beginning to picture it in your mind? And now can you imagine the smell of this place that's around? I mean, it's probably like a strong, peculiar, unique smell all the way around here. And then as they enter into the tabernacle, they're hit with a different smell. Like smells are important to us and, and how God has made us. Like, you know, have you ever thought of that? Like, why, does, why do we have the ability to smell? Why has God created us with that? Well, I think sometimes, I mean, who knows why he's really made us like that, but smells are, they're, they're important. They remind us of things, right? Like I remember whenever uh, I was first dating Luann, like at that time in my life, I was listening to a lot of the Eagles and I was listening to the Eagles, Led Zeppelin, and Harry Connick Jr. is what I was listening to at that time. At that time, I, I, there was this cologne that I, that I wore. Um, it was called uh, Dracar was one of them. And there was another one um, that I can't think of the name of. It was in a little green bottle, not polo, but it was something else. And to this day, if uh, eternity was one of them. That's right. That's what it was. It was the other one. And to this day, if I smell eternity, you know, it reminds me of that moment when I was a Sophomore in high school, in my mom's basement, thinking about Lou Ann, you know? And it smells, they're, they're, they're important. They really are important to us. If any of you have ever traveled to a third world country, I remember the first mission trip I ever went to, which is to Romania. And the Romanian people, they've got some crazy beliefs. One of them is they believe that any kind of air movement on you will make you sick. So when they ride in cars, they ride with the windows up. When they enter into a building, there's no fans, there's no windows open, no breeze. And then again, you got people that don't care all that much about hygiene and don't use a lot of deodorant. And so I remember walking into the first church was like, whoo, man, same way as Haiti. Holy cow. As the, as the plane descends into Haiti, it, it, I don't know how, it just begins to fill the, the, the cabin of the, of the plane. And then when that, when that door opens up, Haiti smells like body odor and burning rubber. That's what, I mean, everywhere in Haiti, that's just what it smells like. But yet it's a good smell. Like it's something that stinks, but yet it's also, for me, it's a pleasing smell. So like even for me now, like whenever I begin to become discontent, because that's what Haiti teaches me, is how content I should be, how blessed I am by being able to live in America and 
having showers and everything that we have. And so whenever I get grumpy and throw a fit because my McDonald's French fries are cold, right? My sense of entitlement goes, oh my gosh, I deserve hot French fries. I can't believe this place. Let's bulldoze down. Let's write the manager. Let's, not that that ever happens, but like, right? When I feel that rising up, what I'll say is, man, I'm forgetting what Haiti smells like. That's what I'm forgetting. I need to go back because I need to be reminded of what it smells like. And so what you've got here is you've got this contrast of smells. You enter into the tabernacle, it's a different smell. It's a smell of, of burnt sacrifices, a smell of this incense is burning on this altar. I think what God's teaching his people is your sin stinks, right? But your worship, that's what it, your prayers. In Revelation, it talks about that there's, there's these priests in front of the throne room of God and they've got these golden bowls of, of incense and it says it's the prayers of the saints. That your worship, your songs that you've sung, that's why it's so important to sing that's why it's important that we sing. So as you sing, it's worship unto the Lord and it's rising up like the incense is rising up out of this altar. It's rising up unto the Lord. And what the Lord's saying, whenever we're singing with pure hearts, we're singing before him, it's, it says it's a pleasing aroma unto the Lord. It's when we pray, it's a pleasing aroma unto the Lord. The next thing um, that we're going to get into is, let's get into, we're done with the tabernacle, move past it, and let's get into the priest and the priest's garments. And so we see this in Exodus, the 28th chapter. And so God had set apart Moses' brother, Aaron, as a priest, as a high priest, and now uh, uh, Aaron's sons are going to be priests as well. And now what God is going to give is he's giving instructions to Moses. Again, Moses is up on the mountain. I mean, let's take a pause right here. Maybe you don't realize this, but Moses is up on the mountain receiving all of this, and God is telling him what he's going to, how he's going to use Aaron. But think about this just for a second. What's Aaron doing in the meantime What Moses is up on the mountain? Aaron's in down below, and Aaron is instructing the people on creating and making a golden calf. And yet God's saying, like, I'm going to use Aaron. Aaron's going to be a guy that's going to, be, that's going to paint a picture of my son, Jesus. Aaron's going to be a guy that gets to enter into a place that nobody else gets to enter into, the holy of holies, into my very presence. I mean, if that's not a picture of grace, I don't know what is. If it's not a picture of God being able to use us and all of our messed upness, I don't know what it is. Like, in you, you're like, oh, you know, I... I, I had this in my past and I got that in my past and I've done this and I've done this. Like I'll never amount to anything and we witness to people and invite them to church. Like I can't go in there. The, the building will fall down. And it's like, well, have you made a golden calf and led a million people to bow down to it? Well, no. Well, guess what? God can still use you, right? Isn't that beautiful truth? Like, but again, you gotta be honest about your sin. You gotta come forthright and you gotta repent and walk away from it, not just sweep it under the rugs. And so what God is setting up here. In Exodus 28 is he's giving the high priest garments. So he's saying this, that I'm going to cover the priest. That's the, that's the picture that we want to think about is with the garments. What's the importance of the garments? I mean, we're going to look at him. He's got this crazy outfit on, and it's like, what's the importance of his crazy outfit? Well, it's here is that God covers sinners. Again, what is Adam and Eve, right? They try to make an inadequate covering, and then God kills the animal, covering them, covering your nakedness, covering your shame, covering your sin. That's the picture is I'm going to cover them so that they can enter into the Holy of Holies. And then each piece of the covering is very symbolic of Jesus. And he sets it all up in a very, uh, just a very profound way. So in Exodus 28 verses one through five, we've got kind of the outline of the priestly garments. He says, then bring near to you Aaron, your brother, and his sons with him from among the people of Israel to serve me as priests, Aaron and Aaron's son, Nadab and Abihu and Eleazar and Ithamar. And you shall make holy garments for Aaron, your brother, for glory and for beauty. Look, God, God cares about beauty. Now, we don't want to take this to the extreme to where we begin to worship beauty and beautiful things and not the creator and the maker of beautiful things. But he says, I care about beauty. Look, you shall speak to all the skillful whom I have filled with the spirit of skill. Man, I love that picture, right? Like some of you in here, you're like, hey, man, I can build anything, right? And sometimes God can use you and he can empower you to utilize your skill, whatever your skill may be, 
It, it comes from the Lord so that you can use it in his service, not just here around the church, but in what you do, using it for the Lord's glory. And they will make Aaron's garments to consecrate him for priesthood. These are the garments that they shall make. So here's the pieces, all right? A breast piece, an ephod, an ephod, a robe, a coat of checker work, a turban, and a sash. They shall make holy garments for Aaron, your brother, and your sons to serve me as priests. They shall receive gold, blue, and purple, scarlet yarns, and fine twin, twinned linen. And then they're going to make these, um, th- this, these garments. And so there you have kind of the pieces of the garments. And so let's just kind of what follows the rest of um, Exodus 28 is just now a description of each of these uh, priestly garments. And so let's read and let's think and talk about each one. So the first one is the ephod, which is actually the, the golden piece. It's, it's kind of like a, a, an apron, kind of like a, a sleeveless dress that the high priest is wearing. And so uh, it's golden color. And this is what he says about the ephod. ephod. Um, you shall take two onyx stones and engrave on them. Okay, so we got the building of the ephod and it's gold and it's blue and it's purple, scarlet yarns, but there's this special feature on the ephod in verse nine. He says, you shall take two onyx stones and engrave on them the names of the sons of Israel. Six of their names on one stone and the other names of the remaining six on the other stone in order of their birth. As a jeweler engraves signets, so shall you engrave the two stones with the names of the sons of Israel. You shall enclose them in a setting of gold filigree. You shall set the two stones on the shoulder pieces of the ephod as stones of remembrance for the sons of Israel. And Aaron shall bear their names before the Lord on his two shoulders for remembrance. And so you can kind of see it in the picture. It's what the breastplate is kind of attached to is these stones that are set on the ephod. And he says what the the importance there is, you're going to write the names of the tribes, right? The people groups of Israel onto these stones. And so he's bearing them on, uh, on, on his shoulder as he enters into, into the presence of the Lord. And then we have the breast piece that's on the outside, verses 15 through 21. You shall make a breast piece of judgment. Let's pause for a minute. A breast piece of judgment, the Lord calls it. In skilled work in the style of the ephod, you shall make it of gold, blue, and purple, and scarlet yarns, and fine twinned linen. You shall make it. You sh- it shall be square and doubled, a span its length and a span its breadth. You shall set in it four rows of stones, a row of sardis, topaz, carbuncle. You shall be the first row, and the second row of emerald, sapphire, and, di- and a diamond. The third row jacinth, an agate, an amethyst. And on the fourth row, beryl, onyx, and jasper. They shall be set in gold filigree. There shall be 12 stones with their names according to the names of the sons of Israel. They shall be like signets, each engraved with its name for the 12 tribes. And so we have in this breast pieces, you have these precious stones Inside Now, as we read the names of those precious stones, anybody, does that jog anybody's memory of another place where it's talked about precious stones like this? It's actually two places in the Bible. One is found in Ezekiel where he talks about in creation, that in creation there are these precious stones. But a second place is in John, I mean in the book of Revelation when John sees heaven. He says that the foundation of heaven is, and it's, listen, listen, this is crazy, right? You ready, ready, ready? It's the same stones, the foundation of heaven, as John sees it, is the same stones that God is using here in this ephod. And so what you've got is you've got, again, a moment in time that's kind of spanning two, two, two very important things, all of creation happening and a new creation that is to come. And here in the middle of that is, is this priest standing in a place of the very presence of God. And it's like he's stuck in between a fallen creation and a creation that is to come. The other um, important part in that is that, again, you see all of these names written on this, bre- on this uh, breast piece. They're the names of the children of God. And it's a breast piece of, of judgment, he says. There's a breast piece of judgment. 
And so what we see is that the priest will represent the people of God with the people's names, right, on his shoulders and written on his breast. As he enters into the presence of God, he will stand there in a place of judgment for all the people as he stands in the presence of God. And then you've got the robe that he wears. In verses uh, 31 uh, through 35, you shall make the robe of the ephod of all blue. And all the Cats fans in the room said amen, right? Not Tar Heel blue, certainly not Cardinal red, right? God's a wild, uh, but of wildcat blue, right? It shall have an opening for the head in the middle of it with a woven binding around the opening like the opening in a garment so that it may not tear. On its hem, you shall make um, pomegranates of, of blue and purple and scarlet yarn around the hem with, with bells of gold between them. So look, on the hem, go back to that picture, on the hem, there's gonna be um, little bells that are gonna be all around. We see that on the very bottom of the robe so that whenever the, uh, the, the high priest is in the presence of the Lord, he's in there making sacrifice and praying and doing all that he's gonna do in there, that you can hear the ringing of the bells. And so what this will become symbolic of is whether or not you know your high priest has sin or not in his life. Because some will go in and they'll be struck, struck dead as we'll see a warning all throughout. You don't wash, struck dead. You don't, you know, do the sacrifices right, struck dead. You don't put the priestly garments on right, you're struck dead. And so some will enter in and they'll be str- stricken dead. And so we, what, what will happen is they're gonna tie a rope. In the Bible, they're talking about, they're tie a rope around their leg. And so when the bells stop ringing, they're like, oh, really, man, boys, you know, send another one in. And so, but again, what, what, what does all that mean? So it means we don't take entering into the presence of the Lord lightly. There's a preparation that must take place in order for us to enter into the presence of the Lord. There's coming a day when you will stand in the manifest presence of the Lord. Every person will stand in the manifest presence of the Lord. And there's a preparation we must undergo in order to stand in the presence of the Lord. That it's not something we take lightly, but it's something we prepare our hearts for. He says also, he says that he'll have a turban on his head and on the turban will be written in gold. There's a, a plate and engraved in the, in, the, um, in the gold will say, holy unto the Lord, holy to the Lord. I've been set apart to the Lord. I've been consecrated for the Lord. The last thing that he talks about here is that there'll be these uh, priestly undergarments and um, verse 42, you shall make for them linen undergarments. Some of you may ask, like, so is God a boxer or a brief guy? Well, he's linen, whatever it is, right? It's going to look more like a dress, but he says there's going to be these, uh, these linen undergarments to cover their naked flesh. Sounds kind of nice, right? They reach from the hips to the thighs, and they shall be on Aaron and on his sons. And when they go back into the tent of meeting, when they come to the altar to minister to the holy place, lest they bear guilt and die. That's somebody who takes underwear seriously, right? But again, what is it a picture of? It's that you must be properly covered. That's what it's a picture of. Like every, everything, all, all the way down to your underwear, you gotta be properly covered with the covering that I give you. Why is he going in such detail? Because God's saying, I'm the one in charge. I'm gonna offer forgiveness of sins. I'm gonna offer a covering. I'm gonna offer a sacrifice. But guess what? It's on my terms, not your terms. I'm the one that's issuing forth this covenant. If you want to come, come. I welcome you, but you got to come on my terms. That's what he's saying here. And then we have this in chapter 29, we have a a means of consecration for the priest. So the problem you have is that the priests are sinners as well. And there has to be a consecration an anointing, a a setting apart of the priest from everyone else before they can enter into the Lord. And so this, what occurs here in chapter 29, is a seven-day process that the priest must undergo. A seven-day process in order for them to be declared consecrated, holy, where they can rightfully wear that, that, that turban with holy to the Lord on their, on their head and where they can enter in. And so that's what we have here in uh, chapter 29 is the consecration. It involves uh, a couple different sacrifices. In uh, 29 verse four, you shall bring Aaron and his sons to the entrance of the tent of meetings and wash them with water. So it's in the, in the bronze basin. You're gonna wash them with water. Then you shall take the garments and put 
put on Aaron the coat and the robe of the ephod and the ephod and the breast piece and gird him with skillfully woven band of the ephod. You shall set the turban on his head, put the, put the holy crown on the turban. You shall take the anointing oil. So now you get some anointing oil. That was in, that, we'll see that in Exodus 30. They take the anointing oil and now you, you pour it over his head and you anoint him. It's a picture of it that it runs down and runs down into his beard, right? It's a holy man. He's got a beard. Then he runs down into his, into his beard. And you pour it on his head and you anoint him. Then you shall bring his sons and put coats on them. And you shall gird Aaron and his sons with sashes and bind caps on them. And the priesthood should be theirs by statute forever. Thus you shall ordain. That's the word ordain. You're setting him apart. Aaron and his sons. And so what we see here is they got to be washed and then there's an anointing that comes. And what the anointing is in the Bible is symbolic of the Holy Spirit. It's, it's a picture of God's consecrating work that comes from the Spirit being poured over him. And then what we have is then he must offer a sacrifice for Aaron and for his sins. And um, it's actually a multitude of sacrifices. And so what you have to have in order for in order for you to go through this process of consecration is you got to have a young bull, two perfect rams, and then a variety of foods, uh, wheat flour, bread, cakes, wafers, these sacrificial foods um, that are going to be set up for a special meal. So what we have here is we have a picture of that happening in the text. And so in verse number 10, um, then you shall bring the bull before the tent of meetings. Aaron and his sons shall lay their hands on the head of the bull. And then you shall kill the bull before the Lord at the entrance of the tent of meetings. You shall take part of the blood of the bull and put it on the horns of the altar with your finger. And the rest of the blood you shall pour out at the base of the altar. You shall take all of the fat that covers the entrails and the long lobe of the liver and the two kidneys of the fat that is on them and burn them on the altar. But the flesh of the bull and its skin and its dung you shall burn with fire outside the camp, for it is a sin offering. Then you shall take one of the rams and Aaron and his sons shall lay their hands on the head of the ram, and you shall kill the ram and take its blood and throw it against the sides of the altar. Then you shall cut the ram into pieces and wash its entrails and its legs and put them with the pieces and its head and burn the whole ram on the altar. It is a burnt offering to the Lord. It is a, here we go, it is a pleasing aroma, a food offering to the Lord. You shall take the other ram, and Aaron and his sons shall lay their hands on the head of the ram, and you shall kill the ram and take part of its blood and put it on the tip of the right ear of Aaron and on the tips of the right ears of his sons and on the thumbs of their right hands and on the greatest toe of their right feet, and then throw the rest of the blood against the sides of the altar. Then you shall take part of the blood that is on the altar and of the anointing oil and sprinkle it on Aaron and on his garments and on his sons and on his son's garments with him. He and his garments shall be holy and his sons and his son's garments with them. And so what we see here is, let's just highlight a couple of principles in this. You, we actually have two offerings that are being offered, a sin offering and a burnt offering, okay? So in the sin offering, you have the young bull who's offered as a sin offering, and there's two parts to the sin offering. The insides, the guts of, that's what we would say, of the bull, they're to be burned on the bronze altar. But then look, the flesh, the skin, and its dung is to be burned outside of the camp. Remember that. And then there's two rams. One ram, the blood is applied, and then the other ram is offered to the Lord and burnt up and consumed by the fire. The other one is uh, it's called a food offering unto the Lord as part of the burnt offering. The other ram, part of it is to be cooked and eaten by the priest. We'll look at that, I think, in just a second. But let's lay, lay out a couple of principles. It's one is you have the idea of transference. You may want to write these down. These are important to us because these show back up in the New Testament. You have the idea of transference. So remember the first thing he says, you bring the bull and then what do you do? You lay hands on the head of the bull. You take the goats and what do you do? You lay your hands on the, on the heads of, of these uh, rams. 
And what's happening there is, is this idea, this notion, it's being symbolized here of, of transference. You're, you're now transferring your sins, Aaron's sins. The priest's sins are being transferred into this bull, into these rams, and then they are offered up as a sacrifice. So as they're, as they're burned up and as they're consumed and as they're sacrificed, so your sins are atoned for. They're burned up and they're consumed. And that's important for us because it is by faith that we transfer our sin to Jesus on a cross. That's what's happening on a cross is it's by faith that we are, in in a way, laying hands on the Lamb of God in Jesus. And our sins are being transferred to him. And then in the same way, it's by faith that Jesus' righteousness is being transferred to us. By the receiving of the Holy Spirit, the anointing, that comes, the, the sealing that comes for regenerate people who receive, uh, who, who receive salvation. We receive the Holy Spirit, and it's, and it's the mark of Jesus' righteousness that rests upon us. Second, we see uh, in, this, in this sin offering that part of it is to be burned outside of the, outside of the camp. You know, the, the skin and the, the flesh and the dung is to be burned not on the inside of the camp, but you take that stuff outside and you burn it. That's important because Jesus is offered up himself as a sin offering for ourselves. And guess where Jesus dies? Not inside the city walls of Jerusalem, but it's outside of the camp is where Jesus is crucified and where Jesus dies because Jesus is, again, portraying and picturing this, that I'm a sin offering. The writer of Hebrews writes this for us in Hebrews 13, for the bodies of those animals whose blood is bought in, who's brought into the holy places by the high priest as a sacrifice for sin are burned outside the camp. So Jesus also suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. And Jesus is our great priest and he's also our great sacrifice. He sacrifices himself for our sin and our sin is transferred to him. Number three, notice that there is blood, Right? Like there's blood everywhere on the tips of their, t- on the ears and on their, t- on their thumbs and on their toes and on the altar and thrown against this and thrown against their clothes, mixed up with the oil. Blood is everywhere. What God is teaching here is here's the principle is no one enters the presence of the Lord apart from the shedding of blood. There is no remission of sins apart from the shedding of And this is pointing forward to Jesus' shedding of his blood. And you and I, when we place faith, when we place trust in Jesus, it's that that idea of transference. We're now transferred, and it's Jesus' blood that enters in. We're now covered and cleansed by Jesus' blood. But Jesus' blood ultimately is the pleasing aroma. It's the pleasing offering offered, offered up to a holy father. And in verses 31, we have this sacred meal that is eaten. Let's quickly, let's look at this. Verses 31 through 34. You shall take the ram of ordination. So that's the second ram. And you boil its flesh in a holy place. And Aaron and his sons shall eat the flesh of the ram and the bread that is in the basket in the entrance of the tent of meetings. They shall eat those things with which atonement was made at their ordination and consecration, but an outsider shall not eat of them because they are holy. And if any of the flesh of the ordination or the bread remain until the morning, then you shall burn the remainder with fire. It shall not be eaten because it is holy. Does that sound familiar to you? We've got a meal coming together where people are gonna eat There's instruction here that only those who have been consecrated unto the Lord, only those who have been set apart by the Lord are to eat of it, and outsiders are not to eat of it. It sounds a whole lot like what we will observe in a few minutes in the Lord's Supper. Eating bread that represents Jesus' flesh, the flesh of the sin sacrifice, the flesh of the ram of ordination, the one who's consecrated himself unto the Lord, who's holy, drinking wine, well, we're going to dip in grape juice, rest assured, which is grape juice. We're going to dip into grape juice and eat that. And what are we instructed as well? Is those outside, those outsiders, those who are yet to be part of God's family, those who are not saved, they're not to eat of this. In fact, what Paul writes in uh, 1 Corinthians is when they eat of it, you're eating and drinking judgment and damnation upon yourself. Well, again, why, why, why? that seems so harsh. 
It seems so, God is saying it's on my terms and holiness is something I take seriously. That we see in all of this is, it, is all of this points to Jesus. And do you see that in this text? But again, what God's given for us here in this is lenses. He's given us means in which we can, categories in which we can understand the function, the role, and the work of Jesus. But the truth is that Jesus is our great high priest, that he is the one who represents us. He is the one who has offered himself as a sacrifice for our sins, and that currently it is Jesus who intercedes with us. And so the writer of Hebrews takes this up in order to say, Over and over again, the writer of Hebrews says that Jesus is superior, that Jesus is greater, that Jesus is better. And so I just wanna give for us the next few minutes just a list of how Jesus is more superior to all of this. Number one, Jesus is superior in his holiness. Jesus didn't need a turban on his head. He didn't need a gold signet or a gold plaque on his forehead to say, holy unto unto the Lord, that Jesus by nature was the holiness of God. So we even looked at last week that Jesus is the one, God in flesh coming to tabernacle himself among us, that it's Jesus as God who condescends to live among us, but he never stops being the perfect son of God. Better than Aaron, we have in Jesus a picture of holiness. He's the perfect son of God. The writer of Hebrews says he is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of God's nature. He didn't need to offer a sacrifice to cover his sin. He was sinless and perfect and perfectly righteous by nature and by experience. He never sinned. Hebrews 7, 26, for it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest. He's holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners and exalted above the heavens. He has no need like those high priests to offer sacrifices daily first for his own sins and then for those of the people since he did this once for all when he offered up himself. For the law appoints men and their weaknesses as high priests, but the word of the oath which came later than the law appoints a son who has been made perfect forever. That's our high priest who's in Jesus. Jesus is superior not only in holiness, but Jesus is superior in anointing. Jesus didn't need oil that represented the Holy Spirit. Jesus possessed the Holy Spirit. This this anointing is kind of, it is a picture of that's what's happening at Jesus' baptism. Jesus is baptized and then in bodily form, the Holy Spirit comes to dwell upon Jesus. That's not to say that he didn't have the Holy Spirit before. Certainly did, but this is an outward picture, a, a, a pointing to before Jesus enters into ministry that Jesus is consecrated and he's anointed, not with oil, but he's anointed with the Holy Spirit. Peter writes this and says this, or Peter says this, uh, Luke writes it for us in Acts, the 10th chapter, that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. Jesus is superior in his representation. That Jesus represents us, those of us who are believers, those of us who are his people. He represents us, not with stones on his shoulders, but he represents us with a cross on his shoulders. Our cross that Jesus bore and took. He, he represents us not with, a, not with a breast piece with our names written into it, but our, but our names as we read, they're, they're written on his heart. They're in him, all of him. And that's what it means. Again, this idea of transference. That for our sake, he made him who knew no sin to be sin, Paul writes, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That he is our representative we transferred our sins to him. That's what it means to be in Christ. We're in his death. We're in his, look, remember the breast piece was a place of judgment. Jesus stands on the cross in a place of judgment, bearing our judgment. Stands in a place of righteousness as well. Extends his righteousness to us. It's the blood of Jesus and the righteousness of Jesus that enables us to stand and will enable us to stand in the presence of God. Who could ascend the hill of the Lord? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. We could have never washed our hands enough to cleanse the stain of sin on our hands, but Jesus gives us a cleansing. Jesus purifies us. He cleanses our hearts, not just our hands, but he cleanses our hearts. But Jesus is superior in sacrifice. 
Hebrews again, 9, 11. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that are to come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, that he entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of blood, of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify, purifying our conscience from dead works in order to serve to what purpose is this cleansing taking place? It's in order that you and I may serve the living God. Like this gives us massive assurance what this work should do is give us massive assurance. How can God forgive sinners like us? Through Jesus. Not through our best works, not through our promises, our broken promises of I'll try harder, I'll do better, but through his son that he's given up as a sacrifice. Oh, but I'm so weak in my faith. Listen, it's not the strength of your faith that saves you and keeps you. It's the object of your faith. And never forget that. Look to Jesus, not to yourself. You feel weak, you feel tired, quit looking at you and look to Jesus. The writer of Hebrews says that he's an anchor for our souls. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul. Who is our anchor? It's Jesus as he represents us in the holy place for God. And Jesus is superior in intercession. That Jesus just didn't enter in and make some sacrifice, but Jesus remains there. Where's Jesus right now at this very moment? Where is Jesus? Well, he's ascended, and he's now at the right hand of God. And what is he doing there? Well, he's making intercession for you and for I, his children. Hebrews 7, 23, the former priests, and many, although they were many in number, because they were, but they were prevented by death from continuing in office. But he, Jesus, holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. Where's Jesus spent the last moments in the garden? Where's Jesus spent, I'm sorry, the last moments here on this earth? Right before he's to be crucified. He's in a garden praying. And who's he praying for? His disciples. And then he prays for those who would believe in his name, you and I. Those that you, Father, you, those that you have given me, I'm praying for them. One time Jesus looks Peter right in the eyes and says, Peter, Peter, Satan has desired to sift you as wheat, but I have prayed that your faith may not fail. We have a great high priest who is interceding on our behalf that our faith may not fail. Press into him, believe him, trust him. That Jesus is our great high priest who sympathizes with our weakness that Jesus understands our pain. He understands your grief. He understands rejection. He understands loneliness. He understands sadness. He understands anxiety. He understands temptation that he's not unfamiliar with your current situation. And we can pray to him as he intercedes on our behalf, mediating for us to a holy father. The whole point of Hebrews is this, draw near to God. Because in Christ, we have a great high priest who is far superior to even the high priest of Aaron, his sons, or any of the high priests. Let us draw near. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him. Since he always lives to make intercession for them. 